Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our webinar today. Our topic today is contingency planning for your practice. The presentation today, the presenters are Kathy Bryant. She is the manager of cyber consulting services at TMLT. And I am Cassie Turner. I am the manager of risk management here at TMLT. We provide for you here a little disclaimer just so that you all are aware that this is not legal um, resources. This is an as is provided and Kathy and I do not have affiliations. Um, and you can take a peek at that at, if you would like. So as I mentioned, our topic today is contingency planning. And at the conclusion of the program, our goals for you would be to explain what you should consider um, including in your contingency plan, describe how to develop an emergency checklist for your practice and understand how to test your contingency plan. Um, before we get into the presentation, I will just mention that there is a Q&A box at the bottom pod. Uh, you can feel free to put your questions there and we will answer those toward the end of the presentation. There is also a files pod that you can download the resources that we've provided for you. There's a copy of the presentation today as well as numerous other resources that we will mention throughout the program. If you want to download all of those resources, if you click on the three little dots there on the screen, it'll say download all and you can download all at that time. So do you have a contingency plan? We did a little poll here at the beginning and it looked like about 50-50 as far as having a contingency plan versus not knowing or not having a contingency plan. So hopefully um, this will either reinforce what you already have in place or give you a starting point of how to develop your contingency plan for your practice. So why is it important to have a contingency plan? One, it's just really good for business. Um, it's a good business practice. And secondly, it's required by HIPAA for you to have this in place. So contingency plan um, is is something that is monitored by the Office of Civil Rights. They are responsible for the enforcement of HIPAA. In 2018, they published a contingency plan white paper, which is in that pod where you can download if you'd like to take a look at that. Um, the goal of your contingency plan is to allow you uh, to return to your daily operations as quickly as possible if there is an unforeseen event. Um, as you can see from this slide, there are many different uh, things that can trigger a contingency plan, anything from cyber to natural um, disasters, and we'll talk about those a little bit more throughout the presentation. So emergency preparedness, um, your contingency plan is not a once and done event. When you're preparing, it's going to be ongoing. Uh, preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation. It's, it's somewhat of a cycle, as you can see here in this graphic. Uh, when you're preparing for unforeseen events, things that you would consider would be natural threats, any human threats, and then also environmental threats that you will want to consider when you're developing your plan. And having a plan is great, but you want to make sure that you've tested your plan because that's even better. The goal would be for you to be confident that when an emergency does happen, that you are prepared for whatever is, is on the horizon and that you're prepared to respond in a, in a timely fashion. So types of emergencies that we will, that in Texas that we are prepared for typically are thunderstorms, tornadoes, Hurricanes, wildfires, cyber attacks, and also pandemics. So those are just some areas of topics that you can focus on as you're developing your plan and things to take into consideration as you're working through developing your uh, plan around each of these types of scenarios. Something that might be helpful to you if you're not aware is that each county has its own disaster uh, hazard mitigation plan and you can reach out to your county for additional resources. They're a great place and they can maybe help identify issues that are respective to your area um, that you may not be aware of. So a good place to start is with your county if you are looking for some additional um, resources and they'll be able to provide those and oftentimes they'll have a template that you can use as a starting point as well. 
on your plan. So how to prepare for human th threats. When you think about threats in your environment, there are going to be external threats that come via social engineering, phishing, ransomware, cyber attacks that we briefly mentioned, database tampering, or theft and uh, of devices or equipment. Generally, these are malicious attacks on your systems. And there are also internal threats that you would want to consider. Most of the time, these are generally accidental, although we have seen where they have been malicious. Generally, it's by someone who was a former employee who is now disgruntled and tries to make attempts to um, hack the data or steal a device um, or something along those lines. Um, the internal threats are typically be failing a phishing attempt, uh, inadvertent database tampering, loading or installing software that should not be approved for uh, that's supported by your system, um, just basic negligence from employees, and then also failure to maintain or update software applications when the updates come out that those need to be pushed out to your systems. So how to prepare for environmental threats. Um, there are many that can interrupt your operations and often cause damage to your facilities. These are just a few more examples for you to consider your HVAC uh, or inadequacy, particularly in your server room that could impact your servers where your data is being stored, uh, power failures or fluctuations in power, um, disruption to your internet, and then also water leaking uh, or types of flooding that can impact your, your equipment. So the HIPAA rules on contingency planning are outlined in the safeguards 45 here that we note for you. And these are just some of the things that they are asking of you in the security rule when you are developing your plan. You're to develop and implement a data backup plan, also a disaster recovery plan, an emergency mode operation plan, and a procedure for testing and uh, revision of plans. And then you're also to perform an application and data critical analysis um, to meet all of the rules of the safeguards in that security rule. And you can just copy and paste that rule if you wanna look at it in more depth and see um, more information on those rules. Well, Cassie, thank you <clears throat> for laying that good groundwork, not only of what kinds of threats that uh, practices and other businesses quite honestly face here in Texas, as well as the all important HIPAA rules. Uh, the business continuity is really another term for your contingency plan. And many people probably are already have some sort of business continuity plan. So what we'd like you to think about is if these are separate documents, maybe it's time to merge them into one because it really doesn't matter what triggers the situation that you have some interruption in business. The goal is to get you back an operational as quickly as possible. For that 50% roughly that don't have an emergency plan, maybe you really do have an emergency plan. It looks something like this. First you panic, then you run. And Hopefully by the end of the presentation, you're not going to think that this is the best plan. I like to think of a business continuity or contingency plan as an opportunity for you to brainstorm with your, uh, with people in your organization. You need to involve all areas of the organization because what might be necessary for a front desk person might be entirely different for the clinical side. So it's important that you involve lots of different people for, from that perspective. And you really want to look at all the potential hazards that you have identified. I kind of uh, like this little cartoon that the computer virus they had was so contagious that they're even refraining from using the electrical outlet. Now that's probably a little bit of overkill, but um, I think that's, that's a, a, a very far-reaching action that they've written into their plan, perhaps. 
But like I said, you want to gather someone from each area of your organization. Front desk, clinical, if you have diagnostics, lab, radiology, perhaps even a physician, if uh, your checkout desk, administration, and billing. And you want to pose a scenario. If you came into work on Monday morning and could not access your EHR and your practice management system, what would you do? Could you see patients? How would you see patients? And what paper tools for the backup, or as a backup, would you need to be able to see patients? And where would you find those? We're going to go through this a little more detailed in just a moment. It's also really important to know not only when to activate your plan, but who is authorized to actually activate the plan. You want to probably limit that to a couple of key staff members. One of the most important things that I think your emergency, or I'm sorry, your contingency plan or business operation plan needs is an emergency contact form. I, I know how dependent I am on my uh, Outlook contacts, and if your computer system were down, you might not be able to get to your Outlook contacts. So you would want to be able to have an, a, some sort of paper copy, in most cases, form that you uh, keep maybe one in your car, maybe keep one at your house, that has basic information. This uh, particular slide has a paper clip on it. That means that it's one of the Outlook, or, or, or I'm sorry, one of the download pods or files. And this is just a place to start. There's probably lots of other things that you can come up with that are equally as important to your organization. If you use an answering service, maybe it's how you get to the back line of the answering service, because if your network is down, your um, computer or your voice activated phone system may be uh, down as well. So you want to think about all of these possible contingencies or, or possible barriers that might come up. Another possibility to throw in here is a natural telephone tree. You may have one already in place, if you're, especially if you're a lord, larger organization, that if you had uh, a, a patient, or I'm sorry, an, a situation where the office would not be opening, who calls who? If you have 100 employees, it's not real practical for one person. So you may divide it up by departments or different kinds of things. There's an example of a generic contact tree uh, in the download files as well. But one thing I would remind you of, there's probably most of your um, software vendors, there's probably some sort of clinic ID or some sort of identifier that you have to have if you were to call into them to, um, to report a problem so that they know that you're legitimate. And so you might want to make sure that any of those special things you have are actually included on this list as well. Business interruption insurance comes in lots of forms and is, is available probably on more than, perhaps more than one policy that you have. Business interruption insurance is coverage that replaces income lost in the event that the business is halted due to a direct physical loss or damage. Um, it might be a fire, it might be a natural disaster. The one thing I can tell you is that if you're going to file somewhere down the road a business interruption claim, it's very important that you have really good notes. You know, what time did, did the event start? 
Who all did you notify when? Uh, if you had to go buy a laptop, for instance, so that you could work if all of your network were down, that you could work separate from your network. You know, did, where did you go buy that? How much did you pay for it? Keep all of those things in a kind of a chronological order, and it will help you eventually if you do file a business interruption claim. I think most of you know that I am a nurse and I came from the hospital side of the world after many, many years, and that we practiced downtimes in so many different ways. You know, we forever had code blue drills or we would have fire drills, and that expanded over the years to all sorts of different emergency drills. When we actually were going into the electronic world. I actually had one of my nurse managers say, we need a computer crash cart. And so I have used her term many times over um, and would encourage you to develop a crash cart. Now, it might be a series of different colored notebooks. It might be some fancy uh, leather filing case or it might just be a cardboard box. But the idea is you want to have everything in one place and everyone knows where that box or that device, uh, or not device, but that set of instructions are that once you activate your emergency plan, that's where you're going to go to get your information. Fari talked about the emergency contact list that um, would be important for you to develop. And again, this is a very high level starting place. You may have a lot of other ideas of things that would be helpful to include on that list. You also want to keep forms that you need to operate if you could not access your EHR. And we're going to talk again about that in just a moment. And then once you have all this in place, you're going to want to practice how the clinic would function. How would you document care? How would you communicate with patients, place orders, and of course, Eventually, how are you going to bill for the services? I think you probably all have developed a cybersecurity strategy by now based on cybersecurity best practices. We've talked about that in the past in a number of different webinars that starts with your risk assessment and your risk identification and your risk management plan. And your contingency plan is part of that. If you identify a, a potential hazard, like your server sits on the floor in your server room, and if you know it's at the back door and water comes in the back door, how are you going to protect that server? So I would suggest that you know that these documents work very much hand in hand. Once you activate your, your incident response and contingency plan, again, our goal is to interrupt minimal or make minimal, minimal interruptions to your clinic operations or to restore them as quickly as possible. So as you talk with your staff in your scenario, you're going to want to talk about what forms do you need to run the clinic for a day, for a week, perhaps even longer? What kind of um, encounter forms would you need? If you had to order lab and you had no way to do that electronically, what kind of forms do you need? What about imaging? And there may be others very specific to your practice, but these are some very common ones that you should think about. Sorry about that. Um, 
there are many, many resources. Some of them are very general, like FEMA, ready.gov, Texas Ready. Those are very, very generic to emergency planning, disaster planning, but they do have some good ideas in them. Then the, there are also several that are specific to the Office for Civil Rights, either through the series of cyber awareness newsletters that they have or cyber attacks. There is a separate resource document that we prepared because sometimes it, the links don't necessarily work uh, from the, the, the PDF of the presentation. So we created a separate resource page with these in it. And then there are also several documents that we've referenced about contingency planning from the National Institute of Securities Technolo and Technology. And these are, again, just there as possible helps for you. We've already mentioned this, but once that plan is developed, you want to make sure that your key staff have them available on paper and on uh, at home and not at just at the office. Because if it's a natural disaster, um, as many of us experienced a year ago with ice and snow, we might not be able to get to the office to get to our plans. If I were in your position as physicians, as administrators, uh, working in a, a hospital, or an, I'm sorry, a clinic situation, I think I would empathize with this particular fellow. My doctor says my hair loss is caused by me worrying about data loss because we know that no matter how frequent natural emergencies might happen, we do know that the potential for data loss or for a cyber attack, especially on healthcare providers, is tremendous. Would we'll just remind you of some basic cybersecurity best practices. Uh, that always starts with having your data backed up and available to you without going through your existing network. You need to have access controls. Close any open remote desktop or desk ports or RDPs. Add multi-factor authentication on anything that you possibly can. Secure your email. Add endpoint protection. Establish a process for ongoing threat detection. Make sure your vendors are operating securely if they have your data or access your data, and have that all-important incident response plan or data recovery and incident or contingency plan. The OCR really does feel like it's very important that you be prepared for an emergency. After they published the contingency plan in 2018, they published a cyber attack quick response, both from a poster, a little poster that you can download, and it's available also on the files to download, as well as a bit of a, a white paper, if you will. We always encourage you to stick in between respond and report the uh, crime we always encourage you to notify your cyber insurance carrier. No matter how small you think the incident is, it's very important that you start uh, that outreach very quickly. Because sometimes what seems like a very small incident grows over time. So what would you do if you could not access your medical records for, oh, say three to six weeks, what would the impact be on patients? What would the impact be on cash flow and reputational harm? 
we continue to hear, I'm too small. I only have billing records on my server. Or who would want my records? And the answer is the threat actors. And the current tool that they use most often is ransomware or a ransom attack. Here's a couple of creative solutions that pra actual practices faced with a ransom attack actually came up with. The first one is a clinic came into work on a Monday morning. They couldn't access their records. They eventually called their, or they couldn't access anything. They called their IT who tried to restore from backup. There were issues with their backup. And um, the one thing that they did, very quick thinking, because they had patients coming in within an hour, was they just handed everyone the patient demographic form that they already had paper copies of and simply said, we're updating our computer files. I need a copy of your photo ID and your insurance card as well. The encounter was documented on the back of the demographic form and they managed to go for several weeks until their files were restored with a very simple process like this. Another practice that had a prolonged period before their files were restored on their practice management system or their scheduling system was they just simply would take or write on the calendar any time a patient called to cancel or reschedule an appointment. Now they didn't know who was coming in, but they could tell you on certain days who wasn't coming in so that if another patient called and needed an appointment, they at least had a few available appointments to offer. I think these were both examples of some real creative thinking. And I will tell you, both of these came kind of on the fly. It wasn't that they thought they uh, thought ahead and said, oh, I'm going to do this. So here's a couple of tips that maybe you can incorporate into your plans as you start developing them. The reality in today's world is the threat actors often infiltrate your network long before you know it. They pretty much have unlimited access to your network files, your patient records, your financial records, physician credentialing, DEA numbers, even employee social security numbers and other personal data. And then when they think they uh, know how your backup works, and especially if it's attached to their, your network, they know they have a good target because they know that if your back is, is attacked and they attack, or if they encrypt your backup as well as your working files, guess what? You're not going to have much of a, a fallback position. You're going to often be forced to think about paying <clears throat> the ransom. So again, they're going to know if if you um, if your financial situation is is very good, they're going to ask for a higher ransom request than maybe a solo practitioner that they're finances are not nearly as high as maybe a large multi-specialty clinic. And then they're going to launch the ransom attack. And uh, hopefully you will have all the things in place that you need. So here's your to-do list. You need to develop that written contingency plan needs to include the key phone numbers, the backup and recovery plan. It needs to, or you need to identify what are your, your critical operational pieces or applications or pieces of software. 
Cassie mentioned this briefly, it's part of the HIPAA requirements. But if your systems went down, what do you need first? Do you need your practice management system back up first? Do you need your EHR system if it's separate from your practice management? You know, if payroll is due in three days, do you need your payroll system back up? You need to look at all the different applications that you use and decide which ones are most important for getting your clinic back to full operations. And many times you have to do this literally just because of the manpower that's involved in getting each of those applications back up and running. They need to know which ones do you want first. You need to make sure all your key staff are educated on the plan and have that physical copy off-site. You need to conduct exercises to test the plan. These are those tabletop exercises where maybe you order pizza for lunch and have everyone sit around and come up with a scenario of what, uh, what would you do if. And, you know, make them hard. Make it the admin is off on vacation in uh, Hawaii or someplace in a different time zone and and the staff have to be creative and decide what they should do without uh, the admins who usually they go to for all the answers. You need to talk with your IT vendor and make sure that they do a complete restore from backup at least annually. I mentioned the one practice who had a backup plan in place. It had never been tested. And what they found was that their backup had been really basically um, not running. Even though they got a message every day that the backup ran successfully, no one had actually checked to see what data was being backed up. And in their case, it had been 18 months since they had a full functional backup. And you can imagine, 18, data from 18 months ago isn't very helpful today. And you need to periodically review those paper items that you need for your backup and make sure that they're current. You know, you don't need to, to have a hundred copies of every page, but you need to have a couple of master copies so that if someone accidentally wrote on one of the the uh, forms, that you have another copy somewhere else. And think about this too, if you have multiple clinics or multiple sites, you need to have the same emergency setup in all the different locations. Once you've got your contingency plan in place, there is a document that was published, um, I don't remember exactly the date, but it is a business impact assessment. And if you work through this document, it basically predicts the consequences of a disruption of a business function, and it gathers the information needed to help develop recovery strategies. I would say this is probably a, a good tool to use after you've got your basic contingency plan in place. But it again works you through a very specific process and uh, is out there if that's what you choose you need to do. As always, unfortunately, so many of our emergencies result in some type of um, HIPAA breach being reported or a breach being reported to the Office of Civil Rights. And navigating that maze of a HIPAA breach or a post breach is very difficult. And so we want to make sure that you um, have the opportunity to 
hopefully prevent this by having a good contingency plan in place as well as having your network protected so that you don't have a reportable breach. I would just encourage you that there are there's still opportunities to submit questions through the download pod. Um, we want to thank you for attending today and we will be launching the CME evaluation. It should be opening in your browser if it opens and you can no longer see the, the Adobe screen. Simply minimize your browser and it will bring the screen back. Your CME certificates will be emailed to you in about 7 to 10 days. Cassie pointed out that the slides and a number of resources are available for download. And I do see that there's one person who's having trouble downloading. We'll certainly be happy to email you those slides individually. You will receive a link to the recorded webinar and it will be posted on uh, TMLT's inReach, which is our CME uh, website. And we're more than happy to, uh, or, or you're more than welcome to share that with others that might want the, the CME for this program. That website is tmlt.inreachce.com. We also have a, a another really exciting top, not exciting, a, a really good topic next week and timely topic that's coming up as our spring seminar next week. And that is improving our response, human trafficking in healthcare. And that's on March 3rd from 6 to 8. And if you need to go to that website, uh, again, tmlt.inreachce.com to register, or you can call our 800 number and they can help you as well. Let's see, I'm looking at a couple of the questions that I think are more administrative. Um, there's a question about sending emails on the day of the course for those who have registered. I'm wondering if that's a reminder email. Um, perhaps you could add a, a follow-up question if that's not what, what you're referring to or if you're referring to uh, the link to the recorded session. I don't see any other questions coming in right this minute. Cassie, do you uh, see any additional questions? No, not at this time. Ah, so it is. So you should be receiving uh, an email on the day of the webinar, a reminder email that has the link in it uh, is what the, the question is. Um, if you're not getting those, you might see if they're perhaps going to spam or, or junk email, or even if your email host perhaps has those blocked. Um, I've been finding unusual things in my junk email um, on, on from people that I routinely get emails from. So a um, couple of things to try checking. If you ever have, uh, have a concern, you know, you can always just reach out to TMLT's main number and they can connect you with our help desk if you're having trouble that particular day. But we'll go through and look at the background and see if we can figure out on on our side what the issues are. 
Also, there is, if you use an Outlook calendar, when you receive that initial thank you for registering email, if you click on the little ICS attachment, that actually adds the event to your Outlook calendar. And so that's another helpful tool because then it's going to be on today's calendar. And again, you don't have to go searching. Don't see any other questions coming in. Again, thank you for attending today. We hope this was informational. Um, if you have questions as you're starting to develop your plan, you can always reach out to us at consulting at tmlt.org and we'll be happy to try to share resources or answer questions if that is uh, if that would be helpful to you. Join us next week or I'm sorry next week. Join us next month and we'll have another exciting topic to cover in our webinar series.